Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome and welcome back to Cafe Ole. My name is Jay. Here at Cafe Ole with Nefesh Benefesh, we go over the everyday Hebrew you need here in Israel to succeed. Whether that's reading and paying your bills, going grocery shopping and reading nutritional labels, keeping up with the news, striking up a conversation, flirting, dating, job interviewing, complaining, all the everyday things you do in your native language, in your country of origin, but in Israel in modern Hebrew. As always, we'd love to hear from you what topics you'd like us to cover. You can always be in touch with us by email at hebrew at nbn.org.il. You can also see all of our previous lessons on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com, type in Cafe Ole. The very first search result should be a link to our playlist with over, I think now, 130 videos, 22,000 views. You can not only see all of our um, previous classes on demand. This class itself will go up in the next day or so. You can also leave us a note there, including some um, requests. You can also subscribe to the Nefesh Benefesh ch channel, excuse me, um, to get the latest of our classes and so much more from them. Finally, if you're joining us live on Zoom, you can write to us in the chat window with regards to questions, comments, concerns, requests for topics, anything you'd like. Um, we just ask you to keep the personal chat to a minimum there. If you have questions about the class we're about to start, please look, um, write to me in the q and I'll only be looking at the Q&A tonight and the chat after class. Um, so if you have questions as I'm teaching this class, feel free to write them in the Q&A. That all being said, also one last piece of housekeeping, which I'll also remind you at the end of um, today's class. In addition to this week's um, Cafe Ole conversation class, where you, I have the opportunity off the record um, to practice Hebrew, both listening and speaking together, which we always welcome you to um, participate in. Um, we will be taking a short one week break next week so that we can start our winter session. Um, we have a whole new line of classes coming up. Some of them are review. Some of them we've never done before. Some of them we haven't done in quite some time. So this is the chance to not only review, most importantly, review our previous lessons, but also write into us what topics you'd like us to cover that either we haven't ever or not in a long time. Um, we still have spaces reserved for your requests, so please write to us. This program doesn't work without your input, and that's why it is one of, if not the most unique ways to learn Hebrew for Olim and, in general, modern Hebrew. Let's get started with today. Um, we've covered this topic a little bit in the past, which is how do you transliterate um, from other languages into Hebrew letters. Um, and that's an important thing when we talk about standardization of transliteration. How do we read Hebrew? How do we create new words in Hebrew? Because that was as much about um, reading other languages in the Hebrew language, as in the Hebrew alphabet rather, as it is about new words. Tonight, because this week is Chag HaHodaya, and we'll get to that word in a minute, um, we're gonna look at English words that have come into Hebrew what are their, some of their sources that we know of? Um, how are they used? And then we're going to look at specifically how do we talk about our countries of origin using Chagahodaya as our example. If you don't know what that is, you're going to want to stay tuned. Um, you know what it is. You just may not know the Hebrew for it because there are Hebrew words for things that aren't necessarily Jewish or Israeli in origin. So with that, let's get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. As always, you are welcome to old school pen and paper, screenshot, or just sit back and relax. You will get a copy of this spreadsheet along with the recording for today's class um, when it goes up probably tomorrow. Um, so don't worry if you don't catch everything, you will get a PDF of this as always. It will also be in the description of the video when it goes up on YouTube. So if you don't get it in your email, you can always go to YouTube and get the link for it there. So. This is a review when we've done um, our class on reverse transliteration. Um, the different categories of words when they come from one language to another. Um, when it, with regards to, from Hebrew to English or Hebrew to other languages, there's a, lo a lot of great stories and information. Some of them are urban myths. Some of them are actually true about words that have seeped into other languages or been adopted into other languages. A lot of them are religious in nature, like Amen into Amen, Hallelujah into Hallelujah, so many others. Um, in American English, for example, 
um, a lot of the words that sound Hebrew were in fact um, brought in by Jewish immigrants and speaking Yiddish. So even though they are Hebrew in origin, they are not, um, when they were first adopted, necessarily Hebrew, they were coming from Yiddish. One of the classics is most is, most Americans know what chutzpah is in some capacity or they've heard it. But one of the best words is maven, M-A-Y-V-E-N. Maven is someone who is an expert in a given field of information, right? Maven comes from the Yiddish pronunciation of the Hebrew word mevin, understands, okay? So even though its origin is ultimately Hebrew, its transaction into um, American English is through Yiddish, and that's why it's pronounced as maven. We've talked about modern Hebrew's pronunciation rules. Maven is immediately understood to be of Ashkenazi Hebrew, because in Ashkenazi Hebrew, pronunciation is on the second to last um, syllable, modern Hebrew on the ultimate syllable, the last syllable, okay? All that to be said, that's gonna be important when we look at English words that have entered into modern Hebrew because origin stories are no less important to understand where they come from, when they were first adopted, um, and how they're used because that does make a difference. Um, one last story about Hebrew getting into English. There's a great urban myth that has never been proved. Um, there's the English word copacetic, that although its origins are still um, un not understood, they're still unknown, um, there's a great urban myth that copacetic comes from hakol besedo, right? Because copacetic means okay, in order, everything's okay. And it sounds like to many ears, copacetic sounds like hakol beseder, everything is okay, which is a modern Hebrew expression. Um, and likely not the source. That is a um, what we call a false cognate. We'll get to that in a second. Um, because, um, actually, it's a false friend. It's not a false cognate. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, mainly because HaKol B'Sedel is mainly found in modern Hebrew, not in um, Yiddish or the Hebrew spoken at the turn of the 20th century by Eastern European Jews. So the thought that they were saying the Hebrew expression, hakol besedel, upon entering America, when this term also came about in the early 20th century, is tangential and is speculative. Okay, let's look at some definitions when we talk about one word going to another. One is what we call a loan word. A loan word is coming from one language and you just plug it into the other one, right? Mail. Mail in Hebrew only refers to email. We have our own word, doar, right? That refers to snail mail, postal mail. Mail, when you just say mail, it always refers to email. Right? This is also something we have in Hebrew. We're going to come up against this word again, um, kwakil. Kwakil or kwak however you pronounce the letter resh, kwakil is a what we call a generic trademark. Generic trademark is when the name of a company for a specific product becomes the name you refer to that product regardless of the um, company that produces it. Kwakil is a great result. Great example, we'll look at a couple in a minute. Kwakil is referred to rolled oats. Okay, the oats that you buy in the store, we're going to come to the actual Hebrew in a little bit. Um, for those of you who need more um, uh, examples of that in English, English, Kleenex. Kleenex is the name of the company, not the name of a facial tissue made out of paper. Xerox. I'm going to Xerox this document for you. Xerox is the name of the company that produces facsimile machines, not the actual product itself. Okay, Same idea we have in Hebrew as well. Kwakil. This is a false cognate. False cognate is where it sounds, um, there's a part of a word that sounds very familiar or sounds similar to a word in the other language, but it doesn't make sense. This is a great example. In rega dal. The word dal in Hebrew means um, poor or less or few. Um, for example, if you want to ask for um, low-fat milk in Hebrew, you ask for chalav dal shuman, right? Low-fat. Dal, to the English-speaking, you know, sounds like dull. And so you have the, the situation where people would incorrectly translate the expression never a dull moment, which is an 
English expression into Hebrew, changing dull into dal, but they're not the same thing. Dull, meaning boring, is not dal in Hebrew and vice versa. So en rega dal doesn't translate into never a dull moment. It translates into never a poor moment. Okay, because a word sounds similar in one language to another does not automatically mean um, it's the same word. Same thing here. This is called a false friend. The word we use in modern Hebrew in Israel for cleaning bleach. This is not um, bleach in other contexts. This is what you use in cleaning materials on your floors, on your on surfaces, um, sometimes even to take stains out of clothes. Economica. Okay. Economica is cleaning bleach. It sounds to some ears like the word economy or economical. It is not that word. It means cleaning bleach. Okay, It has its own um, origin story, its own um, place of origin. But in modern Hebrew, economica means cleaning bleach, not economics. We have a whole other word for that, kalkala, kalkali. That is not this word. Okay, And so you're going to see some of these happen again and again. Some of these are actual coincidences, and we're going to start off with the coincidences to get them out of the way. Sak and ragil. Sak and ragil are Hebrew words. They are Hebrew words that are found in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, they have been used for thousands of years. That happen to sound like two English words. Whether they are originally from Hebrew or not, I leave that for you to go down a Wikipedia rabbit tunnel. Uh, rabbit hole rather, but for our second purpose, it is Hebrew words that happens to also be the same in English. And what you're going to see, we're going to play along on the left-hand side. I purposely did not include the English for a lot of these terms because I want you to be able to hear it as I explain it to figure it out before I plug it in. So this is a little bit interactive as much as we can be with 270 people on this call, which again, 270 people learning Hebrew at the same time around the world, folks, doesn't happen anywhere else but here. Stuck, right? You can hear it in the word. You can see it in the transliteration on the right-hand side, sack. What do you think sack is? Sack is a sack, okay? It's any bag, parcel, um, something that you use to carry other things in. That comes from the Bible. So too in modern English, it happens to be the same word, sack, sack. This is another word I love that this happens to be um, a, a um, what we'll call a false cognate. Um, we don't know the origin. Um, the, the English origin is, is not the Hebrew origin, and yet maybe it is ultimately. Ragil or ragil or ragil should sound to some of your ears similar to the word regular. And that's exactly what it means in Hebrew. If something is ragil, it's regular, it's normal, it's every day. If you say, for example, ke ragil, as usual, right? That's a very common expression to say. Um, Hakol ke ragil, everything's as usual. Um, there's a slang expression, maybe I'll, I'll share on Wednesday because it's a little NSFW. Actually, it's not, but um, nonetheless, further incentive for you to join us on Wednesdays. Okay, these are two words, have the exact same meaning in English and Hebrew, have almost identical sound patterns as in English and Hebrew. Are they connected or not? We leave that to your imagination. The next ones, however, are from English. And that's what I want you to focus on. And I want you to practice listening to with the native Israeli ear, or as much as you would think an Israeli saying these terms. And you're going to hear me pronounce it like as much as possible as a native Israeli does to understand the English of it. Okay, the first two we have here are um, very uh, much in the news. Um, you've definitely heard these in the last um, 400 plus days in Israel. If you've been in Israel, if you watch the news in Hebrew, you've heard these two terms. The first one is definitely in the last... 48 hours alone, it's been said multiple times on the news and by other people. It's even in a commercial that's for a bank right now. Um, I think it's for a mortgage. I think it's for a mortgage. Listen to how I pronounce it. Look at the transliteration. You can figure this out one out fast in English. Money time. Money time. And as you see, I'm pronouncing 
the word in columns C and E, the adopted word, meaning it's coming from English, the expression of the word, into Hebrew. And the transliteration is a reflection of that. Column D is how you would say this in proper Hebrew. When I put say proper, I put in quotation marks. Some of these are not standardized words. Some of these are only trying to use Hebrew terms, Hebrew words to explain something that's otherwise commonly used. Money time. Money time is exactly what it sounds like. Money time. Okay, money time, as it says here in Hebrew, hazman he chashuv beyoter, the most important time. Money time can be thought of as crunch time, the time, uh, a period in which big decisions need to be made, um, ripeness, whatever you want to call it, money time. Money time, um, adopted from the English, um, there's one origin story that it comes from the expression time is money, and it's an inflection on that, but it's the same idea. You hear this term a lot now in the news with regards to what's happening um, in the war on various fronts, particularly as we get potentially closer <clears throat> to a temporary ceasefire in Lebanon. Money time is the period in which the opportunity to do something is at its best, at its ripest. Okay, so money time. Again, we're talking about expressions that come from English that are regularly used, heard and spoken in Hebrew. That is the point of today's class, okay? Money time. This one also, a very um, well-heard uh, word in the last, uh, whatever we're up to now, 14 months. After, after, or after, or after, okay? After, I'll explain it in Hebrew, is a chufshak tzara, a small break or a small vacation, a short vacation, or an event that takes place after an official party. After should sound exactly what it sounds like to you. It's an after. After in Hebrew refers to, as slang as either a short break from military service or an after party. Okay, either one. The point though is after is how we say it, right? If someone gets a break from miluim, from reserve duty for a few days, sometimes even a week, that's called an afdil. It's a short break from military service. Afdil is also, those of you who are heavy clubbers, you know the term afdil because that is the after party. Okay? You go out clubbing, there's an after party if it's big enough. Okay? Great examples, everyday Hebrew coming from English. We talked about kwakil before, the correct quote unquote, proper way to say kwakir in Hebrew is petite shibolet shu'al, flakes of oats, okay, oat flakes. Right? Kwakir is understood by everyone, except perhaps rival companies that also produce petite shibolet shu'al and aren't necessarily going to give free um, uh, advertising to kwakir, aka Quaker oats. AKA oat flakes. Okay. I want you to be able to hear this. And that's why I'm not writing in the English for the first part. First off, because this is not a class in, in with a human face and a dictionary. You can look up these words on your own. I want you to start practicing reading and listening to how I'm pronouncing these words and putting them on the thing to fill in the blanks yourselves and together with me. Okay. Next one, panchil. What is a panchil? The proper Hebrew, which is rarely heard, is tekir. It's very un, not often heard, tekir. But the Hebrew that is uh, adopted from English is heard all the time, panchir. What do you think a panchir is? Panchir is, um, we cannot claim this from the United States. This is a puncture flat tire. Punchil comes from a puncture, as in you have a puncture, a, a flat in your tire. Something has um, gone into your tire, you have a flat tire. In Hebrew, we call that a punchil, coming from the English puncture, understanding as opposed to kuakil, 
right? Coaquel being a generic trademark that came in through American um, trade and commerce. Panchil entered Israel with the introduction of the car as a normal um, vehicle, which only came about during the British Mandate period. So as a result, there are a lot of British um, English terms that have come into um, Israeli society and the modern Hebrew language. And likewise, you'll hear older people in Israel who learned English under the British mandate system have a slight British accent when they speak, both in spelling, but especially in pronunciation. It's slight um, because American um, influence has very much superseded that, but you hear it every once in a while and you have some legacy words like puncho. This is a great one because myself learning Hebrew, other people learning Hebrew, they're never taught the origin of this word because we use this word all the time. So we think it's an everyday word that comes from 5,000 plus years of Hebrew language. This is not a Hebrew word in origin, but we use it all the time. Le'argen. Le'argen. Let me pronounce it a different way so you'll under see if you can understand it, what it means and where it comes from. Le'argen. Le'orgen. Nope. Le'argen. Many of you have already learned this word in Ulpan or in day school or in yeshiva or in university is to organize. But listen to the word again. Le algen, organize. Le algen comes from English. It is not a native Hebrew word. It was taken from or, to organize, plugged in to a um, Hebrew verb pattern. We've talked about this phenomenon a lot of times here because it's really important to understand how new words are created, but also how to create your own words that are understood. In this case, it's plugged into Binyan PL, where a lot of new words come up, and we get the word le algen. It's formed the same way as we get words like le faxes to fax, le sms to sms, le whatsapp, to WhatsApp someone, le facebook, to Facebook someone. But le algen is used so often for something that we think is so commonplace, so ragil, using our previous word, that we don't recognize that it's actually English in origin. Le algen is to organize. Okay, the verb le sadir is not the same thing as le algen. Le sadir is to make some, to put order to something. It's not used in the same way nearly in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, as the verb le algen, which we use to organize. Ani me algen kvutsa shel mitnadvim. I'm organizing a group of volunteers. Ani me algen aucha chagigit lichvod chagodaya. I'm organizing a festive meal for chagodaya. Okay, that's the use of this term used all the time when you're organizing something and an organization, we're already going down this road, is an ilgun, right? Like ha ilgun, one of the three Zionist um, paramilitaries before um, the founding of the state of Israel, ilgun. No matter what you think about the ilgun, ilgun is not a Hebrew word in origin. It is English in origin, organize, organization, ilgun. Right. Sounds like Hebrew. We use it in modern Hebrew. It is not Hebrew in origin. No less used and very frequently, but I must say, il gun. Okay. So much so there is no, um, you'll notice there's a blank here in the proper Hebrew section. There is no substitute for li'il gun, for li'al gen in modern Hebrew. Okay, this one I used to hear all the time. Um, every once in a while, you'll hear it. I looked it up just now online, um, and there are scholarly articles, there are news pieces, and they write this literally in the Hebrew letters. Let's face it. Let's face it. Let's face it. Okay, if you didn't figure it out. Let's face it. Okay. Okay. The proper, if you want to be proper and only use Hebrew, you could say something like "bo nitvade." Let's be, let's be um, honest. "Bo kenim." Literally, let's be honest. "Bo nitvade" is more like um, "let's be lehitvade." Um, lehitvade is let's um, admit. 
to our to to the truth, right? But in everyday Hebrew, you're going to hear "Let's face it," and people are going to say "Let's face it," and then continue in fluent Hebrew, okay? Because "Bonit vade" and "Bonie kenim" is very clunky. We've talked about this before. The Hebrew aesthetics always prefer shorter words, fewer letters, fewer syllables. "Let's face it" sounds better. And especially when you're trying to emphasize something in um, modern Hebrew and Israeli society, if you can use a little bit of English that sounds kind of fancy with a thick native Israeli accent, it goes a long way. And that's another reason why let's face it is very common, both spoken, but also written. Like I just said, I plugged this into Google um, search. So much came out of let's face it and had nothing to do with English. No one was thinking about its origin. This one's a little harder because the Hebrew spelling isn't going to give you a clue necessarily. The proper Hebrew will. Listen to how I pronounce it, and then I'm going to say the proper, and then I'm going to pronounce it like the English. Unseen. An unseen. Unseen. The proper Hebrew for it, the, the synonym is Havana Tanikra. Havana is understanding. Nikra is what is written. Okay, so a written understanding or understanding what is written. Unseen. Get what it is yet? What if I pronounce it like unseen? Unseen. Unseen, or as we would say in English, unseen, right? Unseen is a is particularly in an academic setting. Use in an academic setting, it's a piece of writing, usually a text in a foreign language that's not Hebrew, that you have previously unseen, that you have to translate and decipher for a test. This is a, especially a term used for people taking a test in English or in other languages that they're learning in Israel, and they have to deal with a piece of text that they've otherwise not seen, aka unseen. A piece of previously unseen text for testing purposes, right? So if you were taking a Hebrew test and you were at an advanced enough level that you could read a paragraph of Hebrew, that test would be called an unseen. Unseen, unseen, unseen piece of text. This one isn't so much a literal translation as it is referring to something else. In Hebrew, there are a lot of terms that have nationalities attached to them. Um, I, I, there's, there's a bunch I was just looking up right now. Um, everything from a chatser angli to a, um, what was it? Boreg? I think it was Boreg Shvedi, a couple other ones. But this one, if we're talking about academics already, is one that comes up pretty often. A mifchan amerikai or a she'elon amerikai. Okay. Mifchan amerikai. Or she'elon Amerikai. The proper Hebrew for it is a mifchan brera or a mifchan rav brerati. Mifchan is a test, brera is a choice. Right? So, what do you think a choice test is and why is it called Amerikai? Right? Mifchan Amerikai or she'elon Amerikai is literally a English, an American test or an American questionnaire. When you say that in Israel, in modern Hebrew, a mifchan amerikai, which is the most common way you'll hear it, is a multiple choice test. Okay. The idea is that the notion of a multiple choice test, where you're asked a question, you have a couple different questions from which one of the, is the answer and you have to pick it, is understood in Israeli educational systems as coming from the United States. Therefore, it's called to this day a mifchan amerikai. The proper term is a mifchan brera, a choice test, meaning you have to choose from a um, series of options, but it's often called an American test. Okay? Not quite the same thing as our other options, as our other uh, examples here, but still a great um, uh, understanding of adopting not just a word, but also a term, an expression from one culture into another. This one you can figure out. This one is, um, I hope you can figure this out. Kriti. Kriti. 
or kriti, or pronouncing it more like an American R, kriti, kriti. In proper Hebrew, we would call it chamul, not chamul. Thanks, automatic Nikul generator. Chamul. What? Come on. Come on, keyboard critical. Kriti, critical. Okay, a word that's used all the time in modern Hebrew, kriti, critical. <clears throat> he was found in critical condition. Right? That's how you would use that, kriti. Critical in any sense you would use in, Eng in English, same word in Hebrew. This one is an interesting one because we don't really have a Hebrew alternative to it. Normali, normali. Normali, right? Normal. We use this term just like we do in English, normal. If something is normal, it's normali in Hebrew. Um, one of the reasons why is because what is normal? Not to sound too existential, but because we don't really have an answer for that. We use normali um, very much, showing how we don't have a term for that in Hebrew. Ragil is a close term. Right, it meant regular, normal, every day. That could be one, but normali is especially known in Hebrew as when you ask someone, "Ata normali?" When you ask someone, "Are you normal?" It means like, "Are you serious?" Or on the other side, "Are you crazy?" Right? "Ata normali?" "Tagida ata normali?" Yo, are you? Are you? What's up with you? Right? For not to use the the word crazy. Okay, normali. Another. Very popular loan word from English into Hebrew we use all the time. Ah, these are two expressions that are translated from English into Hebrew. They are perfectly good Hebrew, and that's why they're in both columns. Perfectly good Hebrew. The difference is these are not Hebrew in origin, nor are they Israeli culture in origin. And you'll understand when I explain them. You've probably heard at least one, if not both of these before, if you listen very carefully, but you'll also understand why these are not Israeli, but they are heard in Israel. The first one, anirak maniach etzekan, or if you were a female, anirak menicha etzekan. Anirak maniach etzekan is the equivalent of the English, I'm just gonna leave this or it here. Right. <clears throat> I'm going to explain, just like with the next one, why it's used, but it is not Israeli in origin. I think you can figure it out. If not, I'll explain. And the next one, ani in parentheses, it's usually not said ani, rakomel, just like you would say in English, rakomel. Just saying. It literally translates, just like the first one, it literally translates from the English to Hebrew and vice versa. Rakomel means just saying. Both of these are not Hebrew or Israeli in origin. Why? They're coming from American English. Both of these, when you understand how we use them in English and in Hebrew, are very passive aggressive. Anirak meniach etzekan, right? Imagine someone sliding a piece of paper or something they want someone's attention to get to. Instead of saying, please look at this please pay attention to this. They're sliding it across the table, not even necessarily looking at it, saying, I'll just leave this here. That's a very passive aggressive thing that Israeli culture is not necessarily known for. Same with Rakomel. Think of how when you hear someone say, I'm just saying it would be nice to do this, right? In modern Hebrew, in Israeli culture, we would call that Ashma Polanit or Ima Polania. Um, Polish guilt or a Polish mother would speak like that. Again, a very passive aggressive way to get your point across to someone by saying, I'm just saying it would be nice if you called more, right? Very classic. Rakomel. These are, again, loans from English into Hebrew that, while they make perfect sense in Hebrew, are not Hebrew slash Israeli in origin. That's the name of the game for today. Okay. With that, let's look at an example of taking, we've gone from individual words to individual expressions to larger cultural understandings like to 
whole cultural institutions from one one culture to another. In Israel, we have a number of holidays that are from diaspora origins. The first and biggest one is Mimuna, celebrated the night after Pesach ends. That was celebrated by North African Jews. That has become it's not just a cultural institution in Israeli society. It is an official holiday. It's not a religious holiday in the way that Jews and Israelis know you have the day off, you don't have to do work, and so forth and so forth. Think of it more like a civil holiday. Right. Israel doesn't have a lot of civil holidays like we have in other countries. We have Independence Day. We have Memorial Day. We have these um, diaspora origin holidays like Mimuna, like one coming from um, the Kurdish community, Sahran, like um, Sigid, the Ethiopian Jewish holiday that's celebrated right about now at the time of year. And our newest one, Novi God, the Russian New Year at the end of the um, civil year. And this is why. Um, I like to think the next holiday that will be called a civil holiday in Israel is a civil holiday many of you already know, Chag Ha'odaya. Ha'odaya comes from the same root as the verb lehodot, and the word you probably all know, toda. What does toda mean? Thank you. Chag Ha'odaya, Thanksgiving. Okay? That's how we say Thanksgiving in modern Hebrew, Chag Ha'odaya, right? Because the pilgrims... Whether you want to say adopting, whether you want to say taking um, Jewish notions from Sukkot and other holidays about giving thanks, especially about harvest, Thanksgiving came about. Thanksgiving is a misnomer still for many Israelis because they're not used to, number one, because of its origins, the pilgrims landing in um, um, Plymouth Bay and all of that. Um, number one, and pilgrims being religious um, refugees, and so therefore there's some Christianity attached to it, but also because, again, in Israel, aside from Memorial Day and Independence Day, and even with Mimuna and Sigid and all those others, we don't have civil holidays the way we do in America, right? There is no equivalent of President's Day and uh, Columbus Day or Ind Indigenous Peoples Day, as it's perhaps now called, and Veterans Day and New Year's Day and Thanksgiving and other things like that, or in other countries like bank holidays in the United Kingdom. We don't have that in Israel. And so many Native Israelis think that Chag Odaya is a Christian holiday because they assume that all holidays, with the exception of their own, to civil holidays are religious. Okay? Chag Odaya is a great example. Fellow Americans, you can attest to it is not a religious holiday. It may have been when it first started. It is certainly not now. I'm not getting into that argument. That is a declarative statement, folks. If you don't like it, tough. Okay. What are some of the things that we eat on Talanagol Hodu? Because it is a holiday about eating. And again, we're using Chag Hodaya. Excuse me, Chag Hodaya. We're using Chag Hodaya as an example of how do we adapt and adopt words from one culture into another. In this case, Thanksgiving, what are the terms we use for Thanksgiving coming up to it, uh, very much up to the day, to help explain what we're doing and what we're eating, especially to people who aren't used to celebrating it? So first off, the word for turkey. The word for turkey we talked about um, quickly last week in Hebrew is tarnagol hodu. It's often just referred to as hodu. Anyone who, are, who loves eating shawarma in Israel knows that a lot of the shawarma that you eat on the street is made out of hodu. And it will simply say at the top of the skewer rack, hodu or shawarma hodu, referring to the fact it is not Indian uh, shawarma. It's coming from the turkey. Turkey, as a source of food, um, has a name depending on where people think its mythical origins are. The fact that we call it turkey in English testifies to the fact that the people who brought turkey or were first introduced to it to, um, to the bird um, and were native English speakers thought it came from Turkey. Okay, That Turks ate turkey, which is one of the reasons why the country of Turkey just changed its name to Turkia. It's to be pronounced it in Turkish so as not to be confused with the bird. In Hebrew, just as you hear, it's Tarnagol Hodu, meaning it's the Indian rooster or the India rooster, just as many people thought it came from India. For example, in Turkey, it's called Dindi. In other countries, it's called, um, in French, it's Dond, right? They thought it came from India. Everyone has a different name for it. There's one, um, I forget off the top of my head which language it is. It's called Peru. 
because they think it came from South America. Okay, regardless of it, this is what we call Turkey as in the bird. Okay, those of you, my fellow Americans, if this is your first time celebrating in um, Chag Odaya in Israel, let it be known that while Turkey, Hodu, is a very popular meat to be eaten in Israel, it is very hard to get a Hodu Shalem a whole turkey in Israel. You usually have to order it far in advance from a butcher. You can't just go into a supermarket and get it. I know we think we run the world. We don't. It is not a popular thing to eat a huge turkey, much less buy one. Israeli kitchens are just not equipped for that size of a bird. Oftentimes you'll find chaze hodu, whole turkey breasts, which are just as big. Um, and a lot of butchers will require that you order it well in advance. So you may be pressed for time. If you're all of a sudden rushing to find one, um, you may not be able to in time for Thursday or Friday if you celebrate um, Shabbat Thanksgiving. Okay, this word is commonplace in a lot of languages around the world, batata. Batata in Israel means a sweet potato. Right? Um, Oftentimes in English, when we say sweet potato versus yam and we confuse the two, we're always referring to a sweet potato and very less a yam, which is a totally different species. Same in Israel. We are only referring to a sweet potato. Regardless of color, it's a sweet potato, batata. Right? This word is an important word because we don't have it in um, Jewish cooking up until um, Jews arriving in English-speaking countries is the word pie. Pie is pie, okay? Pie is obviously a filling, savory or sweet with a crust that is different from other forms that we have in Jewish cooking around the world. It is not, for example, a pashteda. Pashteda, a very classic Israeli and Jewish food, is best known as a crustless quiche, right? It's made out of egg. It doesn't have a crust. Pie obviously has to have crust. Dlat. Dlat is not a term that is foreign to Jews. Dlat is eaten by Jews, um, especially Jews in Middle Eastern countries, as well as in the Mediterranean, ever since it was introduced from um, the Americas uh, 500 plus years ago. Dlat is pumpkin. Okay? Um, dlat as fresh pumpkin is very commonly eaten by Jews in those communities. Canned pumpkin, as we know, is not as common. You can find it in a lot of stores this time of year. Pecan is um, a great way to settle the dispute of how you pronounce this nut. In Hebrew, there's only one way to pronounce it, P-E-C-A-N, whether you are team pecan or team pecan. In Hebrew, it's simple, pecan. Mlit or milui comes from the uh, same root as the verb le male and the adjective male. Mlit or milui is the word we use for stuffing. For Brits, I know you say differently, that is dressing. And for some Americans also say dressing, this is otherwise what we call stuffing. If you, For Israelis, if you decide to, decide to be adventurous and invite native Israelis to your Thanksgiving meal this year, and they sort of give a look at mlit or milui, what is this? Um, you can very calmly explain that Mlit or milui comes in a lot of forms in the world, including in many Jewish cookings. For example, stuffed um, anything, whether it's stuffed vegetables or stuffed meat, is the same idea. The stuffing in it is the same word we use for um, stuffing either in a turkey or in a casserole dish. Right? You can even think of things like kugel. Kugel, or in modern Hebrew, kigel, was originally made as um, bread dumplings that were cooked inside your cholin pot for Shabbat. This is a very common thing eaten around the world. And if you think it's only an Ashkenazi thing, ask your North African friends about mafrum. Mafrum is anything but stuffing. It is a stuffing of meat and vegetables inside a vegetable. And that's actually built so it's contained inside. That is no less mlit or milui as bread stuffing or bread dressing. Chamutziot, we've talked about this word before. We're going to talk about it again ahead of Pesach because it seems shares the same root as many words in the Hebrew language, including the words for oxygen and pickles and chametz, proper for Pesach. But for our terms, you know this word as cranberries. Right? Um, this one I had to look up because I didn't know how to say it um, because it's, again, not something you normally 
have on the Israeli food table, but is an important one nonetheless. Rotev basal. Rotev is sauce or dressing, and basal is meat. What is a meat dressing or a meat sauce? Gravy. Gravy is not a common thing on the Israeli table, common um, place, but that's how you say gravy in Hebrew. And finally, this is actually from the French, very much adopted into American food, very much a part of this holiday for some people. Pronounce it, you can see it on the transliteration on the right side. This is casserole. Casserole, or casserole, coming from the French for the pot in which you cook a casserole in. Okay. We're going to wrap this up because I see we have questions in the um, Q&A. This is a chance also if you wrote in the chat and you actually have a question for me, please write in the Q&A now. As a preview for Wednesday's class, which is all going to be about sharing stories or sharing traditions from our countries of origin, right? The fact that um, the vast majority of Israelis, um, not the vast majority of Israelis, many of Israelis still are immigrants themselves, ulim, that came from other countries themselves or their parents were coming with different traditions. And so we're going to talk about how do we share those traditions, especially those of you who are celebrating Chag Odaya this week or any other tradition from outside of Israel. Here are some of the ways we're going to start the conversation or how you're going to um, hear what other people are asking you. Um, we're going to go more into this into detail on Wednesday, but these are some of the conversation prompts. Not only are we going to use them, but are a great way to talk about yourselves. And if you celebrate Chag Odaya, um, how to um, frame it in Hebrew, right? So for example, if you someone wants to ask you or you want to ask someone, where, do, where are you from? Okay, in Hebrew, you're often taught me'efota or me'efoat means where are you from? That's incorrect. It literally translates to that. But again, literal translation is not always the same as what's spoken. If you simply ask someone in Israel, in Hebrew, me'efota or me'efoat, it translates to where do you live? Where are you from? Oftentimes, Hebrew speakers and olim get confused because they're taught in their formal Hebrew classes, me'efota is how you ask, where are you from? And they immediately start saying, ani me'otzotabrit, ani me'anglia, ani me'kanada, ani me'australia. They start answering where they're from originally before Israel. It does not mean that. If you want to ask someone, where are you from originally, i.e., where did you immigrate from? Me'efo'at ota b'makor. Or Bamakor, Bamakor originally. Okay, that's the difference between these two. We'll go over it again on Wednesday. No Ladati, I was born in. Gadalti, I grew up in. Aliti, me, I made Aliyah from. And this is where you start sharing your traditions, right? Lichvod, in this case, Lichvod, Chagodaya, for Thanksgiving. Hainu Osim. We would do or we would make, you could say, we would make a festive meal. And then you can start explaining what that included, right? Because that's your masoret, tradition, or minha, custom. Okay, some of the words we're going to use on Wednesday, we're going to add a few more. Um, but again, today's class, very much about English that happens to be in Hebrew, some of the origin stories of them and that you recognize them, whether they're literally the same or not. And obviously for fellow Americans who are celebrating Chag Odaya to have some words to go along with your feast this week. Let me start answering some questions in the little bit of time we have left. Um, again, Wednesday, um, Cafe Ole Conversations, talking about um, not just Chag Odaya Thanksgiving, but in general, sharing your own um, traditions from your countries of origin. Um, and next week, we are taking a break. You will shortly get in your email, as well as on our website, as well as on our social media feeds, the link to sign up for our winter sessions. If you don't get it, you can always go to our website. You can always email us at hebrew at nbn.org.il. You will need to sign up again for our winter session. We look forward to seeing all of you and definitely bring a friend. Um, as we say in Hebrew, chavel mevi chavel. Friend brings a friend, literally, but bring a plus one, bring someone else to join. Um, this is a open secret that needs to be shared with a lot more people that we're doing. We'd love to have more people join. Let me answer some questions in the time we have left. Um, 
Is regular using grade of gasoline? No, that's not the term they use. Um, they're by um, points and not driving. I don't know the, the differences. Usually it's 95, I think is the regular, but it's not called ragil. Can you use money time in a sentence? Um, a money time who can. Money time is now. We need to return all the kidnapped. No better way to use that term. Why is it not kvakil with two vibes? Great question. Um, we have a whole class on transliterating from other languages into Hebrew. Like I said, kvakil or kvakil are both understood and um, said in Hebrew because two vibes in the middle of a word usually indicates that the word is not Hebrew in origin. And so that immediately tells you that the normal pronunciation rules of Hebrew don't apply and that this word is a loan word. Um, two vibes is very uncommon in the middle of a word for a native Hebrew word. Um, what is the difference between le'algen and le'sadel? Like I said, le'algen is to organize. Le'sadel is to make something, to put something into order. Le'sadel coming from the same root as the word sedel, order. Um, L'Sadel is more to put something in order, to fix something, is another way to think about it. L'Sadel, um, you're, you're fixing something that needs to be um, fixed, rather than to organize. You don't necessarily, um, like you can both L'Algen and L'Sadel Aron B'Gadim. You can use both verbs to organize a closet. Um, but l'sadir inyanim, to organize or to um, make order out of things, rather than le'algen kenes, to organize a conference. That's the difference. Is ilgun a Hebrew word, or is it buttered like le'algen? So if you didn't get that, what I explained. And that goes back to a lesson, by the way, folks. Another plug for our previous lessons. We talked about verbal nouns a few weeks ago. If you were paying attention then or you did your homework, you know that ilgun is the verbal noun of le'algen. Just like in English, organization, the act of organizing or the product of organizing is the verbal noun of um, to organize. Okay, Le'algen is the verb. Ilgun is the verbal noun, meaning it has the properties of both a verb and a noun. Ilgun is the way that we've adopted and adapted the verb le'algen from English into Hebrew with Hebrew grammatical terms to come up with the verbal noun, the shem peula. Ilgun is the act of organizing, also the entity that's in charge of organizing. Great question. Punchil, I've heard is any catastrophe. Um, that's that sounds about right in terms of being um, hyperbolic about anything, that if there's a panchil in anything, it's the end of the world. So yes, you could use it as a catastrophe. That's a great context. But panchil immediately means a flat bear. Is le again the same as lehistadel? Absolutely not. Lehistadel is to, um, as we've used it before, when someone asks you in a store, atamistadel means, are you all set? As in, you are... Um, you're taking care of. Le'algen is to organize, to physically organize something. Versus lehistadil, which is animistadil, I'm okay. It's the answer of, do you need help in the store? And you want to say no, animistadil, lo animistadil, or animistadil simply means I'm okay. I'm, I'm all set. I'm in order. But it doesn't mean in order in the literal sense. Um... What about an open book test? Folks, if I didn't include it here, it means that it's not included in our list, meaning that it doesn't have an idiom or an origin story from English to Hebrew. An open book test is literally mifchan im sefer patuach. You literally translate an open book test, right? But something like an unseen or mifchan amerikai isn't something you can necessarily look up in a dictionary and know. That's the difference what we do here at Cafe Ule. I'm not a human dictionary. I happen to be, but that's not the point of this class. It's about explaining things that you can't just look up. So if I didn't explain it, that's implied that you can um, find this on your own. Hegioni means logical. It doesn't mean normal. It doesn't mean regular. Hegioni means logical. Someone asked, how do you say within normal lim limits? Um, 
במסגרת uh, טווח נורמלי. Within a normal range is how you would translate that in the, in the framework of a normal range. Um, האופציה הזו נורמלית וסטנדרטית in an effort to reassure someone. Yes, um, again, there are many other English loan words that we didn't get into. There's a lot, a lot of English loan words, in fact, in Hebrew. Um, we only got to a few of them. But yes, האופציה הזו נורמלית וסטנדרטית. This option is normal and standard. Makes complete sense in Hebrew. Even though all those words, except for ha and ze and haze, are loan, wor are loan words, That's totally understood by Hebrew speakers. My former Hebrew teacher called words that are directly in English as foreign words. Mail, catch-up sandwich, today's class is many words that are not exactly foreign words. Can you clarify this? I'm not going to split hairs over the terms we're using. I'm giving you examples that you hear in everyday Hebrew that come from English. Let's, let's leave the um, definition as that. Hope that makes sense. Hodu is the country India. Um, that is actually in the Bible um, when describing the realm of Hamelech um, HaChashverosh in Megillat Esther, um, as well as in other places. Hodu is not the word for the country Turkey. The country Turkey in Hebrew is Turkiya, very similar to the uh, way you say it in Turkish. Hodu is India. Someone trying to flex uh, my mathematical skills. I do not know what the term for pi, the mathematical term is in Hebrew. Can't pull that off the top of my head, but I'll try to get back to you on that. Rotev salat is salad dressing, 100%. Rotev is sauce or dressing is in salad dressing, coming from the same root as the word ratuv, wet. So rotev is something that applies wetness, moisture to something else. How would you say meat sauce? like spaghetti sauce as opposed to gravy. Um, meat sauce is a very American expression. Um, you would simply say rotev bolognese. That's how you would say it. Um, you wouldn't say meat sauce because again, rotev basel means gravy in Hebrew. Um, someone going into history, didn't ask for that, um, but thank you for that. Um, okay, we're running out of time, folks. I see some people asking questions, some people trying to add their information, which is always great, but we don't have time for that. Todarabad, thank you all for joining. Copy of this class will go up on YouTube in the next day, along with the spreadsheet as a PDF. You will also um, find out, if you don't find out by email, certainly on youtube.com. We hope you will join us this week with the same um, login link as you've used in past Cafe Ole conversations. For this one, it's the last of our fall season, just like it today was. You will get an email with registration link for our winter session in two weeks from today. Hope you join in the meantime. Todaraba. Thank you all for joining. May we only have good news and lihitrot. See you all very soon. And for those of you who don't join on Wednesday and those who celebrate, Chag Haodaya Sameach. Happy Thanksgiving.